The 1979 accident at Three Mile Island Unit 2 severely damaged the reactor core. During the accident, the pilot operated relief valve, or PORV, located at the top of the pressurizer, stuck open. This allowed water, in the form of steam, to flow from the cooling system to a drain tank and eventually to the reactor building basement floor. This loss of cooling water uncovered the core and allowed it to overheat. The loss of coolant was stopped and the reactor system brought back under control, but not before the core sustained significant damage. At this point, an overview of an undamaged reactor is in order. This diagram shows a cutaway view of the inside of the reactor. The reactor vessel is a large steel tank. It contains the fuel core and related components. At the top of the reactor, there is a 170-ton cover bolted to the vessel. This reactor vessel head contains the mechanisms that move the control rods in and out of the core to control the fission process. It can be unbolted and removed to open up the reactor. Inside the reactor vessel, on top of the core, is a structure called the upper plenum assembly. Now, this serves as a guide for the control rods as well as directing the flow of coolant. This can also be removed to clear the way for defueling. At the center of the reactor is the core region containing the nuclear fuel. There are 177 assemblies of fuel rods arranged in a grid pattern. Over 200 fuel rods make up each assembly. These are held together by stainless steel end fittings at each end and by spacer grids distributed along the length of the assembly. At the top of the fuel assembly is a spider, which holds the control rods as they are moved in and out of the core. The core is supported by a cylindrical core support assembly, also known as a CSA. Below and around the CSA is a space where water enters the reactor and flows upward through the core to cool it. At the bottom of the CSA is a series of flow distributor and support plates. These plates evenly channel water through the core. Early information on post-accident conditions was obtained by visual inspections performed with miniature underwater television cameras. The first opportunity to view the core region damage was in 1982, when one of these miniature cameras was inserted through a control rod mechanism down through the plenum and into the upper core region. The operation was known as Quick Look. A pile of fragments was resting on the remains of the core. The top of the rubble bed was five feet below the top of the original core region. Much of the debris was shapeless and unrecognizable. Scattered about in the debris were some recognizable components, springs, pieces of control rod assemblies, tops of fuel elements, and rods of various length. The void region was five feet deep and extended in many places all the way out to the edge of the core. Before further investigations and defueling could begin, the head and the plenum had to be removed from the reactor vessel. The head was removed in July 1984 and placed on a shielded storage stand in the reactor building. The plenum was removed from the reactor vessel in May of 1985. It was transferred to its storage stand in the flooded deep end of the refueling canal. The damaged area on the underside of the plenum was inspected during the transfer operation. This was the first time the whole grid plate and the associated damage was clearly visible. The foamed appearance of the stainless steel is caused by the interaction of the steel with steam at high temperature. To defuel the reactor, workers stand on a six inch thick stainless steel rotatable work platform mounted on top of the reactor vessel. Through a slot in the platform, they use tools with 30 foot long handles to accomplish defueling operation. In October of 1985, workers began to remove the tops of some of the standing fuel bundles and other debris to allow installation and operation of the canister positioning system. Now this is a carousel type device suspended under the work platform. It holds five defueling canisters. The top of the collapsed fuel core looked like this. The fuel rods and large pieces were picked up individually and placed in canisters. This was the pick and place defueling phase. As defueling progressed, 
The rubble and loose debris were removed using a tool called the spade bucket. The spade is the straight part of this tool. It dug into the rubble, and the bucket was then closed on the rubble to lift it into the canister. A hard layer discovered earlier by probing with a pointed rod was reached. Defuelers found that their hand-operated tools could not break through the solid mass. In addition, a wall of solid material was discovered around the periphery of the core. In July 1986, after most of the loose debris had been removed, the Core Stratification Sampling Project, better known as Core Bore, was begun. A specially modified drilling rig provided by the Department of Energy was mounted on top of the reactor vessel, and hollow core drill bits were used to bore into the damaged core. From each of ten locations, a drill string containing a long cross-sectional sample of the core was extracted and placed into a defueling canister. This was later sent to the Department of Energy facilities in Idaho for further study. Videotape surveys were then performed in each three and one half inch diameter hole. The middle of the core region was found to be a solid mass of once molten material that extended as deep as five feet at the center of the core. This mass was found to be quite hard and brittle, apparently ceramic in nature. Visible in this mass, particularly near the top, were metallic streaks and clumps. These apparently were partially melted end fittings and other structural components. No significant voids were seen in the ten locations examined. At the bottom and sides of this mass, agglomerated material consisting of fuel rods and pellets surrounded by once molten material was observed. This is a transition zone between the once molten mass and the intact fuel rods and fuel rod stubs. Under all of this are stubs of fuel rods. They are shiny, indicating they were underwater throughout the accident and not exposed to the oxidizing steam environment. Videotape inspections of the lower CSA show that in most places there is no damage and little debris between these plates. On the east side of the reactor, however, a large amount of once molten material was observed. The material appears to have flowed down from the flow holes in these plates. This material was visible from four different core bore inspection locations, all on the east side of the reactor. The actual route or routes whereby the core material may have reached the lower core head was not found at this time. The lower head of the reactor vessel was videotaped via two access paths. In 1985, cameras were lowered through the annular space between the core support assembly and the reactor vessel wall. On the way down, the visible external surfaces of the core support assembly were inspected to see if any structural damage occurred. Not only was there no damage of any kind visible on the core support assembly, there was little or no debris accumulation in this region. In the lower head region, however, piles of rubble-like debris were found. It was estimated that there are 10 to 20 tons of rubble in the lower head. Also visible was debris hanging down through some of the flow holes in the flow distributor head. The material appears to have been molten and possibly fractured on cooling. On the north side of the lower head was found a wall of debris standing 15 inches high and over 5 feet wide. The second inspection path put a camera right in the center of the lower head. During the core bore operation, a camera was lowered all the way through the lower CSA and the flow distributor head into the lower head region. The debris in the center of the lower head was granular and was piled up almost to the flow distributor head. A summary of conditions in late 1986 showed the bed of rubble removed, exposing a mixture of once molten re-solidified debris in the lower center of the core. This was five feet thick in the center and one foot thick at the edges. Below and around this mass were the remains of fuel assemblies still in their original form and locations, varying in height from one foot to over five feet. In addition, a large amount of debris made its way to the lower head region. In October 1986, a large diameter flat-faced drill was used in the Department of Energy drilling rig to break up the solid mass in the center of the core. Defuelers resumed loading the resulting debris. The drilling operation left a number of large rocks, 200 to 900 pounds each, 
which would not fit into the defueling canisters. An air-operated impact chisel was used to break these rocks into smaller pieces that would fit into the canisters. Most of the rubble and rocks created by the core drilling operations were cleared away. On May 5, 1987, a video inspection of the core cavity was conducted. This view is looking down at the top of the debris bed in the core cavity. A few loose fuel rods and gravel-like debris are visible, but the cavity has been picked clean of large pieces of debris. At the top of the picture is the peripheral solid mass of material known as the donut. Here we see more of the donut. The donut is the ring of material outside the radius that the drill could reach. The whole central region of the core was a solid rock-like formation before the core drilling. A little higher, the donut ends and there are geometrically intact fuel rods. The remains of the horizontal in-canal spacer grids are visible across the bundles and some debris is visible between the rods. The wall behind the fuel rods is the core baffle plate, which encloses the fuel core cavity. An airlift tool was used to remove the loose debris that was left on the top of the stub fuel assemblies. With clear access provided, defuelers began to remove the stub assemblies. A clamp tool was used to grab the top of the first two assemblies and lift them out. With a path to the bottom of the assemblies now available, a more efficient tool the fuel assembly puller was used to lift each assembly from under the bottom end fitting. By mid-July, 42 assemblies had been removed. As procedures and tools were improved and operator skills increased, the pace accelerated. 94 assemblies were transferred to canisters by the end of August 1987. One of the tools improved was the fuel assembly puller, seen here about to engage a fuel assembly. The spike that was added plunges into the top of the assembly, preventing it from falling off the puller. The assembly is then lifted from the grid. We see the use of this improved tool with one of the new tools in this defueling sequence. The stub assembly is held vertically by the improved fuel assembly puller. The second assembly came loose with the first, the only time this happened. The new fuel assembly handling tool grabs the second assembly and breaks it loose, keeping it vertical. This assembly is transported to the carousel, where the funnel guides it into the canister.